Larissa and Sarah's latest publication, Peace Pedagogies in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Theory and Practice in Formal Education, focuses on the importance of institutionalizing peace pedagogy in uh, formal education and teacher training in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and this is the work that uh, Larissa and Sarah are going to talk to us about today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you to the Center for Peace, Rappi Center for Peace of the University of Cornell. Thank you, the University of Cornell and Einaudi Research Center. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to receive this invitation and to have a chance to speak today on the topic that actually follows the, the publishing of our book, which was introduced in the opening, the book on peace pedagogies in Bosnia and Herzegovina theory and practice in formal education. It's been a great pleasure to offer the topic that we framed uh, of greater relevance, we hope, uh, for the connections that the participants and the audience can make for the context where they live and work and struggle or try to understand the issues and the challenges of peace education in their own local communities, but also more broadly in the world we live in today. So the topic of our talk uh, that we have prepared to be shared with students, and our idea was to present in around 35 to 40 minutes, after which we can have 20 to 25 minutes of discussion and reflections and get the questions and, of course, get the comments and feedback from the audience, if this is fine. This is how we had planned uh, for today's lecture. I hope this is acceptable. So the topic is peace pedagogies in a divided society, and we really wanted to make uh, connections from local context, which is the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which we both, Sarah and I, researched, lived through, and uh, sort of framed in a lot of publications and in a lot of practice-oriented uh, actions and research initiatives and project initiatives in the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But we also provided in the subtitle title the connection to global perspectives, because as I mentioned in the beginning, it is really critical that we sort of create this solidarity between the communities, the context and different practices and initiatives that we each bring in in this dialogue. So what we are proposing is the structure with several key areas that we would like to discuss today. Uh, the first one will be to sort of contextualize in the comments uh, that we heard in the beginning, just entering this virtual classroom, the students were commenting on the importance of contextualizing any initiative and any framework in peace education. So we will start off since the book, uh, we are, which we are aiming to present and sort of uh, instill interest for, is really framed for the context of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So we will try to frame it very briefly in terms of trying to lay out different principles and different issues that have defined the realities of Bosnia and Herzegovina 30 years after uh, the war that happened in the 90s. We will then uh, discuss uh, the role of peace pedagogies, the purposes, the conceptual frameworks, different approaches and applicability in a divided society, but also in the changing communities and the societies we live in today in our global community of the world we, we all share. Uh, from there, we will also discuss and bring in this perspective on the importance of institutionalizing, uh, so to say, inter institutionalizing and integrating uh, peace pedagogy within the institutions of higher education by trying to build and, and sort of develop the pathways for systemic and systematic integration of peace pedagogies in university institutions. So this is also, this will be the focal uh, point in, in the presentation. And lastly, we would like to conclude the lecture and the presentation by bringing in the global connections and the discussion and actually hearing from students, audience and other researchers and, and practitioners. Even though we had these formal introductions in the beginning uh, with very kind introduction made by Patricia, we would still like just to briefly uh, tell you a few words about the connections to our own peace journey. And I will start by saying just very briefly, uh, what brought me to the field of peace education is the unfortunate circumstances uh, of the war in the 90s in my country, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, which actually caught me in the senior year of a high school when I was a senior in high school and without having any opportunity to continue 
my university education and to pursue my university degree at a time, I found myself uh, really in a position when I actually got really actively involved in peace work in a local community uh, by providing psychosocial support for war traumatized children and their families at a time. So this was in the early 90s. Uh, and this work has greatly shaped my commitment to philosophy of nonviolence, to the idea of peace education and peace pedagogy, and has sort of framed all future decisions and informed my sort of perceptions and orientations in my professional work that framed the importance and infused the importance of peace education, peace pedagogy, and peace values in my educational work. So that currently from the position of the associate professor and as someone who founded and uh, presides over the Center for Peace Education, uh, Peace Education Hub at the University of Sarajevo, I have this continuous sort of uh, look back uh, to the many years of the continuous dedication and continuous struggle uh, in terms of trying to frame uh, the educational work and reclaim uh, human potential and transformational potential of education in my professional journey. So this is briefly the connection to my peace journey. And I'd like my dear friend and a colleague, uh, Sarah, also to say a few words about her connection to the peace journey and what she's bringing in this dialogue. Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, the invitation to be here today. It's really a great honor and a pleasure. And we're looking forward to some rich discussion. Um, I would just add for my uh, peace journey, thank you so much for introducing me at the start. Um, I also began my, my peace journey uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in the late 1990s. In the late 1990s, about five years, a little bit less than five years after the war ended, I was a master's degree student. Uh, in conflict resolution. And there was a university um, ministry of education partnership that was created um, to introduce the first post-war peace education initiative with primary and secondary schools in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I went with a team of master's students who collaborated with local teachers intensively on a day-to-day -day basis in war traumatized communities for a period of two years. And I was coordinator of that process. So it was a formative experience for me in many ways because it took me from theory into practice pretty rapidly and exposed me in that context of um, collective violence to the um, significant psychological dimensions of uh, peace building and resistance to peace building. And I think that has fed into um, my curiosity as a scholar and as a practitioner and as a curriculum developer as well, um, looking at what are the psychological and psychosocial dimensions of peace building um, that we need to address as we also address economic, political, social aspects. Um, and that's taken me into different areas of teaching peace psychology and conducting research and practice on these themes um, in other contexts as well. So I think that's uh, that brings us to today. So I'll pass back to you, dear Larissa, and, um, and you'll take us into the first part of our presentation. Yes, thank you so much, Sarah. So you can see also how our paths have merged over the course of many years and how we came up with this idea also to collect and to bring good practices in the past five years, which is how the book actually started, the research for the book started. Uh, but it, you know, it didn't happen, it didn't occur sort of out of blue. It was preceded by many years, by decades of hard work, dedication, and really uh, professional sort of stamina and professional commitment to the field. Uh, which brings us to the first part of the lecture that we would like, or the presentation, which we would like to frame around the context which I introduced in the beginning in the outline. And this is the first part where we would actually like to give you an overview without going into too many details because the situation in Bosnia still 30 years after the war is very complex and very complicated, which makes it a very unique context in 
the global community of other countries and other post-conflict communities. But we thought that the discussion around the issues that, that were illustrated in the book on peace pedagogies in Bosnia and Herzegovina is really important to have some elements or some key points or some uh, essential pillars to help you better understand the frameworks and the transitions, some of the key transitions that have occurred in Bosnia since the outbreak of the war. So we frame them in these uh, different thematic areas, which actually also uh, paved the way for another publication that Sarah and I prepared and submitted for the Southeast uh, uh, Journal, Southeast Europe Journal, uh, which is coming out probably anytime soon, uh, anytime from now uh, should be uh, published with some of these uh, elements that we are presenting here for the part one in the lecture where we actually wanted to point to a lot of political and ideological transitions that the Bosnian society has gone through uh, from the disintegration of the former Yugoslavia that happened in the early 90s that uh, actually resulted in the war, which I mentioned in the beginning, that caught me uh, and my family uh, in, in my particular case in, in the stage of being a high school student, as I said, but then from war to peace, which is the situation and the reality we live now 30 years after the war, but that sort of quality of peace is subject to be understood from various angles and from different perspectives, where this peace is actually still by many seen as a frozen conflict, uh, since we are witnessing on a daily basis uh, the everyday violence and the formations and, and the instances of violence that uh, take on different shapes and different uh, elements in everyday spheres of social life and political and cultural life in Bosnia. We also transitioned from uh, the state that uh, was dominated by the communist uh, re communist political party uh, to the emerging democracy. And within these uh, transitions from centralized economy to market economy, uh, we are also seeing a lot of these uh, instances where this market economy brought with itself the notion of uh, commodification of knowledge. So we are seeing also a lot of instances where marketization of knowledge and marketization of education is taking place in light with these transitions uh, that are actually connected to, to the economic transition from centralized to the market economy in the frameworks of, of uh, political and ideological spheres of Bosnian life. Uh, we also transition from the state-driven education to internationalization and standardization. Uh, we are seeing a great emergence of uh, international initiatives, international collaboration uh, uh, projects. We are also seeing many more connections with other international universities that have created different counter narratives and other elements in terms of understanding the importance of education and the transformative or political role of education that uh, is to be understood in the context of Bosnia as well. On the other hand, uh, we are pointing to a lot of structural and policy transitions in education from centrality to failing harmonization. And this centrality uh, is understood as, you know, the political and the policy documents at the state level, which unfortunately Bosnia and Herzegovina is uh, really struggling to achieve because we are still seeing the divisiveness and the fragmentation of uh, the political structures being mirrored in uh, the educational framework and educational policies, which results in 13 different ministries of education, two entities, one independent uh, district of Bočko, which all complicates and really creates lots of challenges in the realities of Bosnia we live in today. Uh, we are seeing the expansions of private and international education initiatives. Uh, we are also witnessing uh, the shift from disciplinarity, which was very traditional in the former Yugoslavia, but these days we are seeing uh, the attempts to actually uh, make a lot of these attempts and a lot of these linkages across different silos and different frameworks of, of science through the interdisciplinarity efforts, which still poses a great challenge because we sort of stick to very traditional uh, uh, perceptions of uh, sciences and fields. So that attempt and that's, that shift is also posing a lot of challenges. Uh, on the other hand, the field that is really important for both Sarah and I, since we have been involved in teacher training and teacher education, the shifts in teacher education, the shifts from theoretical notions of understanding how teacher education is played out 
to more practice oriented and more practical aspects of training teachers to address current issues and problems in the communities and the society uh, poses yet another challenge for uh, the within the structural and policy transitions in education. And of course, uh, many of the shifts and changes that we also discussed in our book, uh, which are related from uh, the transitions from non-formal to formal peace education initiatives, which actually imply to the realities where a lot of these peace education projects and programs and initiatives were really connected for a long period of time were initiated and were uh, framed and maintained through non-formal educational institutions. While these days or since recently, there have been trends to actually recognize the importance of infusing and integrating peace education through formal educational structures and uh, institutions. On the other hand, very important shifts that have occurred, which my dear friend and a colleague Sarah will say a few words and, and provide more details, are really related to something that is almost seen as a phenomena in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I'm sure could be translated and connected to other communities uh, globally. And this is the shifting generations and attitudes towards peace and its prerequisites for actually framing peace education as a formal educational approach to, to all levels within the formal educational structures, and also trying to understand how these identities have shifted uh, from those of uh, uh, the generations who lived through the war, like in my own example, uh, to the generations of the kids, of the students that we teach, today of their parents and how they struggle in terms of understanding how different identities and roles are actually, you know, making our positionalities differently in context of teaching and learning about peace and advocating for peace. And lastly, uh, how some of these peace pedagogical transitions also influence the way we understand uh, dealing with the past, which was very much dominating the spheres and the narratives in Bosnia in the period right after the war, to the challenges of today where we are trying to see also how economically, how socially, how culturally we need to revive our infrastructure, our communities, uh, so that we can deal with the past, uh, with the present and the future of the country, while at the same time, the history is lingering and is sort of, you know, seeping through uh, all spheres of life visibly and invisibly, so that we are seeing a lot of challenges still when it comes to these peace pedagogical transitions in terms of really trying to find the best approach uh, that will sort of frame more institutional uh, strategy and more institutional approach to, to learning and teaching about peace. And lastly, of course, uh, since recently and with the global changes of migration, we are seeing uh, that Bosnia and Herzegovina is also uh, transitioning from refugee sending, which was happening during and right after the war when a lot of Bosnians actually looked for the refuge internationally and globally to the situations that we are now receiving a lot of refugees also, and we are trying hosting refugees. So we are becoming the country which is hosting refugees and that is having a lot of implications also for peace pedagogies and educational practices that we need to rethink and come up with something that is more applicable to the world we live in today in the context of Bosnia. Uh, so this is the framework of the key of some of the key transitions. And from here, I will try to uh, bring it over to uh, Sarah, who will now try to connect this framework of the larger sort of uh, context of all these different challenges and transitions that have shaped and uh, and uh, influenced the Bosnian society of today with specific focus on peace pedagogies and different approaches and purposes. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, so here I'd like us to just um, uh, do a quick review of what do we mean by peace pedagogies. And I know that the group has received readings before um, the session today, so I won't go into a lot of detail. We could advance to the next slide. Uh, please, Larissa. So I just wanted to um, contextualize also what are we talking about when we're speaking about peace and peace building. Um, anyone familiar with the field of peace and conflict studies, I'm assuming all of you are, will be familiar with the notions of negative peace and positive peace, which of course come primarily from a sociological perspective um, that looks at direct cultural and structural violence and um, correspondingly direct cultural and structural openings for peace building and um, creating positive, uh, socially just peace. 
Um, to that, I would add also the importance of inner peace coming from psychology and social psychology, which arguably has been um, neglected or marginalized in mainstream peace and conflict studies until more recently. And so therefore, I would also add here the importance of the psychological and social psychological. When we're thinking about peace, we also want to be mindful that peace and conflict have both individual and collective um, expressions. And um, there are different layers from the local to the global and everything in between. Peace uh, can be defined in many different ways, but we would want to look at all of these dimensions and keep them in mind and, and recall that peace is both a process and a goal, and there's nothing static about it ever. It's inherently dynamic because every context is constantly shifting, as are the actors within those contexts. Um, so this is quite a, this academic view of peace is perhaps different from popular notions of peace as a state of tranquility or stasis or um, yeah, non-movement. Non um, peace building likewise, we're re referring to um, maybe a general definition as a wide range of strategies, actions and processes designed to strengthen constituencies for peace at the level of attitudes and relationships, as well as supporting structural changes aimed at longer term peace, justice and reconciliation. So there are so many different definitions of peace building that we would like to keep these two dimensions in mind. What's important for our purposes today is to bear in mind that peace building is inherently interdisciplinary, it's inherently multi-sectoral and multi-layered, even though traditionally it's been treated more as a security, political or economic concern. It has applicability across all sectors and it inherently links with education at all levels and across all disciplines. For those who have um, not regarded education as a key concern in peacekeeping, peace negotiation spheres, international diplomacy and so on, arguably we can say that education is actually a security issue um, and a key to conflict prevention, mitigation and transformation. The, the abuses of education are now um, more deeply understood um, as a weapon. Um, it can be used as a weapon and it's a vital tool also for conflict uh, transformation and peace building. Um, maybe we can move to the next slide, Larissa. So um, we didn't say that this is a talk about peace education. We said it's a talk about peace pedagogies and that's deliberate. Um, peace education tends to be understood as a very narrow treatment of peace in the educational sphere. It tends to be regarded as a specific subject with core content about peace, about the history of peace, about the history of peace research and um, various uh, treaties and charters and so on and so forth, um, possibly about um, different modes and modalities of engaging um, with emotions and relationships and conflict resolution and so on and so forth. There are different dimensions that fall under the sort of classic peace education curriculum. We specifically focused on peace pedagogies because peace pedagogies go beyond the what of peace and the what of peace learning. They focus more on the how, as it says here in this uh, quotation. In peace education, the how we teach is just as important as the what we teach. Pedagogy is the lens through which peace education is regarded. It is also the form that the educational process then takes. That is the teaching strategies, approaches, and methods that are employed by peace educators. So peace pedagogies, right from the go, is something that can be applied methodologically across all areas of teaching, across all disciplines. You can integrate peace pedagogies into sciences, into um, uh, various uh, fields. It doesn't have to be just a, a peace education class. Let's um, go forward. Now, if you were to dive into the world of peace pedagogies and literature, and various uh, sources and resources, what you'll come up with is not one, not two, but in fact, dozens of different approaches to peace pedagogies. And um, that has been treated in more detail in the chapter that you received um, and hopefully have had a chance to look at. So I won't go into it very, very deeply, but a few are mentioned here and please ignore the icons because they're not related. Um, critical peace pedagogies, healing peace pedagogies, intercultural peace pedagogies, decolonial 
um, peace pedagogies, arts-based, nonviolence, the list is, is much longer even than this. What's important to understand is that it's like having a different sets of ingredients and different recipes in your kitchen. Um, each of these different approaches to peace pedagogy has a different aim. It has a different learning aim and a different outcome and a different objective. And they're not all compatible in the sense that um, they may arrive at uh, processes or learning outcomes that are um, in contradiction to a different state that a different peace pedagogy would be trying to elicit. So I'll give an example. An example is uh, critical uh, pedagogy, which is, yeah, we can go to the next slide. Um, critical pedagogy, which you may be familiar with, um, which comes forward most famously through the work of Paulo Freire, um, has the educational aim to liberate um, oppressed peoples. That's the aim. And the theory of change behind critical pedagogy is that through conscientization, we become aware of sources of oppression in society. We become aware of our own oppression. And through praxis, we engage reflectively, actively, proactively in transforming those sources of oppression. So the instructional methods that a critical pedagogist would use would be to expose, debate, critique, um, uncover, unpack through critical reflection um, the various uh, abuses of power, power inequities, power inequalities in society, historical legacies of abuses of power um, and economic inequalities and political inequalities in order for um, uh, individuals and groups and communities to band together and to um, uh, take agency into their own hands to act in order to transform the status quo. Um, so it's a very much an advocacy, very much an activist um, approach to peace learning, unfounding injustice and inequality and shifting the whole, shifting the whole constellation. And then the desired learning outcome of critical peace pedagogies is to um, foster critical consciousness and political agency. Now, if we go back to the previous slide, um, a healing pedagogy is going to be different. It's going to have a different uh, uh, purpose. It's going to have a different methodology. It's going to have a different theory of change. It's going to be more about creating spaces where enemies or where communities that are carrying wounds are able to look at themselves and within themselves and at each other and create those spaces of compassion and uh, compassionate listening and repair and um, uh, apology and um, witnessing and collaboration that will enable those social, psychological, spiritual, emotional wounds to heal. These are also peace pedagogies. When do you use which? So you need to figure out what's in your kitchen before you can figure out what you're gonna cook. And if we can go forward now two slides, Exactly. How do you know which piece pedagogy to use? So here are here are quick tips. The quick tips are before you choose your piece pedagogy or be, before you choose a combination of piece pedagogies, you may want to combine a few, you may want to sequence them. There are a few things to keep in mind. Number one, what is the conflict phase? Is it a latent conflict that has yet to burst open? Is it an open and violent conflict? Is it a recent post-conflict situation where there's stability but the damage is still vast and apparent. Is it a historical um, uh, conflict which has intergenerational dimensions? So that's the, the first thing you want to figure out is where are people at in relation to the conflict? What is happening with the conflict itself? The other thing is you want to ask yourself, what are the positionalities happening in the classroom space? Where are the teachers and students themselves situated in relation to this conflict? Are they on the side of the perpetrators? Are they on the side of the victims? Are they outsiders? Is there a mix of these roles? Um, uh, do they have strong political allegiances? Have they experienced loss? Are they con continuing to live in conditions of oppression and deprivation? 
Is this more cultural memory? So there are many different positionalities that will be taking place in the classroom. Are they majority? Are they minority? I mean, it, it, there's a whole mix. And you want to choose a peace pedagogical approach, which is attentive to, respectful of, responsive to, uh, holding space for those different positionalities. And then the next question is, what are the different people in the room experiencing as barriers to peace? Is it attitudinal? Is it economic? Is it political? Is it a poor relationship in the classroom space? Is it a lack of respect in the classroom space? So there may be any number of different barriers to being able to move towards having a serious conversation about peace building and conflict transformation. And, and in relation to those barriers, there will also be needs. So we want to understand what those are. And if we can go to the next slide, then I'll just give one little example. So in my research, I've looked at now three generations of people, almost four generations of people in classroom spaces in Bosnia and Herzegovina, because we're getting on 25 years almost since I um, was collaborating with Bosnian educators and students. So in the immediate post-war period, everybody had lived through the war. Today, every single student, even through the end of bachelor's, maybe even master's degrees, were born after the war. In the transitional years, we would have many of these different generations in the same space. So there were people who had been raised and educated and professionally developed in the former Yugoslavia under the, under the banner of brotherhood and unity. And then there would be people like Larissa who had had their childhood and their youth stolen, if you would, by the war, who had lived a totally different reality and were um, in, in uh, many respects like their elders, trauma survivors from the war. And then only a few years after that, um, around 2014, when I was conducting some of this initial research, um, a new generation who is born into a society that neither knows Yugoslavia nor knows the war. What they know is a transitional society that's trying to become European, that's trying to learn about democracy. And yet there's a lot of intergenerational taboo, uh, trauma and the talking about the past is taboo. In the earlier generations, people would say, everybody knows who did what. We don't need to talk about the past. And in the later generations, they say, nobody will tell us what's going on. We know that something happened, but nobody will be frank with us about what happened. And then, of course, as you move into further post-memory generations, they're like, oh, that was ages ago. That's the past is the past. Can we just focus on now and what's happening in the future? And people don't want to carry the burden of that past anymore. It's like, who wants to carry the burden of the Second World War? Like, that was ages ago, right? So this is the kind of shift in mentality that's taking place. And if we can skip to the next slide, I won't go into all the details, but I think you'll receive this PowerPoint. This is my little quickie. Um, analysis of the different conflict phases that were presenting in Bosnian classrooms, different positionalities that needed to be considered. And of course, also we need to consider the element of time. And then the different barriers to peace and needs in order to feel comfortable, in order to feel supported, in order to feel engaged in peace building. And I differentiate between teachers and students referring to the generations that I studied. Um, so I think there's a lot for us to discuss, but I just wanted to bring this up to illustrate that there's nothing, there's no one size fits all for peace pedagogies. And at the same time, it's not random either. There is a way to structure how do we choose which approach to use. And in this case, I'll just say, say that at the end of the war, the peace pedagogies that we focused on were healing pedagogies. That was the first. If we had come right in with critical pedagogies, which is what's wrong with society, to be honest, people were up here full, over full with what was wrong with society. They didn't need to talk about that anymore. They were trying to rebuild humanity in themselves, dignity. So healing had to come first. Critical pedagogy would have been untimely. As time goes by, then we could move into pedagogies of reconciliation because you need people to collaborate in order to do anything else. 
And now as time goes by, critical pedagogies become more and more important because there are ongoing injustices in the society. And there's a certain emotional distance that now allows us to have that conversation. So I'll leave it there and I'll pass back to you, Larissa. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so we will, this is a good way also to introduce uh, from the research that Sarah did uh, with these cross-generational uh, positionalities and different ways our identities have shaped the way we understand conflict and also how some of these experiences have been mirrored or replicated in the classrooms and in, in schools. This is a good way also to bring us to the third part of our uh, presentation, which is the framework of uh, trying to understand how we make these pedagogies integrated and sustainable across different levels of education. And here the focus is really on formal education and on the attempts to uh, try to understand what are the prospects, what are the challenges, and what are uh, the long-term visions of institutionalizing peace education in higher education institutions. Uh, before we actually discuss what elements comprise uh, systemic and systematic approaches to integration of peace pedagogies in higher education institutions, we want to uh, acknowledge that there is a huge need for systemic responses to conflict in the local context of Bosnia, but I think beyond uh, the context of Bosnia, across different communities and in, in the whole world, uh, which we share, the planet we share. Uh, and there are a couple of questions that we wanted to, uh, which are also found in the chapter, which we assigned on how and why should universities teach for peace, where higher education institutions should teach for peace and these several questions we thought were really important to be sort of just laid out here for us to think through as we also try to make connections to our local communities and our global uh, environment. So can any country truly be regarded as post-conflict? Uh, Bosnia is usually uh, defined as a post-conflict country, even though it's been almost 30 years since the outbreak of the war. But looking historically and through the history of human behavior and human uh, histories across the world, any country could be categorized as a post-conflict society, as a post-conflict country. And according to uh, some researchers, every time uh, the country is living uh, in the stage of peace, it's actually uh, finding itself between two stages of war, either the war that, you know, is in the history that we are learning from the books or the war that might uh, that might just, you know, come a long way around the corner as the situation changes and as uh, the political and economic uh, situations or, or challenges worsen in the context. So what is a post-conflict country? And in connection to uh, peace education, is it really uh, responsible for uh, learners to put them at the sort of central focus at the heart of expecting the learners in the context of educational institutions to bear the responsibility actually uh, to, to work for peace and to rebuild the societies and to infuse uh, peace in the societies. Is locating them at the heart of, the, of this process not in itself problematic? Is really important uh, question also to consider because uh, by putting this whole focus on learners themselves, uh, we disregard sometimes the larger frameworks and the larger injustices and the larger political imbalances of power that actually have created the conditions where uh, peace has been jeopardized or peace has been lost or has been subject to, to threat. Uh, also, in terms of how we language peace and how we language discussions around peace, we wanted to bring in the awareness that peace education and peace pedagogy as specific terms uh, could be sometimes considered very loaded terms. In my own situation and in my own context, I prefer the term intercultural learning, intercultural pedagogy, intercultural education as more neutral term in the period right after the war in the context of language education and teacher training, because peace was also considered very loaded, very contested. So many authors propose that the use of language could be, uh, that the use of language has to be real. We have to be careful on the way we language the discussions around peace. So maybe proposing uh, the terms like managing conflicts or reducing violence or using or, or doing some preventive work uh, cultivating heightened awareness of the underlying causes of conflict in connection to inequalities, 
uh, exclusion of certain groups, marginalization of particular uh, minority groups, or discrimination, which are considered structural forms of violence or cultural forms of violence, is also uh, very important to be considered when we discuss the systemic responses to conflict. And of course, understanding that uh, armed conflict is a system rather than one singled out event, and that it always requires cross-institutional and interdisciplinary responses and thorough analysis of the context and the histories and the root causes uh, for, uh, for, for the realities of it, it brings to, to, to communities. So in connection to institutionalizing peace pedagogies, we speak of different elements that are really creating this sort of holistic view of what is necessary in terms of uh, incorporating specific policies on dialogue, training, capacity building, collaborative initiatives. What is important in connection to curricula in the institutional approaches to integrating peace pedagogies in connection to how we frame institutional conflict analysis through specific courses, programs, uh, different programs at different levels of, at the level of masters, at the level of bachelor degree, specialized trainings, how we plan for peace education programs and what long-term strategies we use when we discuss integration of peace pedagogies in curricula. We also, uh, for us as, as teachers and, and teacher education specialists, it's also very important to discuss systemic and systematic and institutional uh, responses to integration of peace learning and peace education to teacher training. And this is also equally important, not just for the humanities and uh, for the specialized programs in peace education, but also across different subjects where teachers could find connection to how they can teach or how they can transform they, their curricula or how they can role model specific uh, skills, values, and attitudes that are related to peace education within their fields of subjects and within the niche of their uh, uh, special program. And of course, in connection to practices within the institutions of higher education, it is really important not just to have long-term visions or strategies, but also near-term visions, which is related to what Sarah mentioned, depending on the stage of the conflict that the country or the community or the institution is currently at, it is also important to think in terms of what are specific and adequate and timely responses to addressing uh, situations of conflict. So the near-term uh, solutions, for example, in situations where the conflict is taking place would be, or immediately, in the immediacy after uh, the conflict, would be proposing and developing psychosocial support and providing psychological support to, to process the war traumas uh, that the community teachers and students are going through. And of course, in terms of practices, research in conflict transformation, research in peace building, uh, the way we disseminate information and dialogue, and how we actually transform Lo from glo local to global uh, communities and how we make these uh, humanities uh, programs and these specific peace education programs applicable in specific contexts is another important element to be considered for the institutionalization of peace pedagogies. Uh, very important for the institutional approaches to integrating peace education is also peace planning. And that refers, I'm not going to go into all of the details. As Sarah said, we will be happy to share the slides with uh, anyone who's interested to get more details of the elements we discussed. But here, I would really like just to point to some of these important pillars for planning of the integration of peace pedagogy uh, in, in the higher education institutions. From governance level, where it's really important that the universities follow the whole institution approaches of democratic and inclusive strategies uh, to peace building integration and uh, peace building values in their university mission. So this is really important at the governance level so that that sort of top-down support is provided for the communities and for the practitioners in the classrooms and at the school levels. Uh, policy strategies, programs that promote nonviolent social change, inclusion and participation that really speak to the holistic approaches to education is also important at the governance level. And addressing, of course, any instances that are currently visible and that are currently present in the community, the instances of inequality, discrimination, exclusion, or silencing. At the level of the curriculum, it is important to try to initiate new programs, new courses, new debates, the lectures of like the one that we are having at the moment, 
that are related to peace education, peace and conflict studies, issues of global citizenship, that actually from our perspective as educators really emphasize reclaiming of the human and relational dimension in education, which we consider really at the heart of, of uh, a lot of these peace education initiatives and practices. We also want to uh, emphasize that at the level of curriculum, there is a potential in each discipline at the university level to contribute to peace or to contribute to conflict. So that the ethics and uh, the use of knowledge, whether the knowledge is used for power or the knowledge is used for the well-being of the local and the global community is really an important uh, discussion that needs to take place within, uh, within the frameworks of specific uh, fields and specific uh, disciplines. Experiential learning is also very important. It's, it's essential in extending collaborations beyond the classrooms uh, in terms of working with communities, with local and global communities, but also across cultures and across countries like we are having today in the international solidarity group of uh, exchanging and contributing to better understanding our role in peace work. Uh, discussing and analyzing with students the, the role of peace values in each of the disciplines and developing these applications and long-term recommendations would be another important topic. And of course, for the instruction and pedagogy, I think Sarah already mentioned a lot of these elements that are really critical for pedagogies. Uh, and I would just like to single out the support for teachers as yet an, uh, another important element where we found out in the book that we, um, as part of the research uh, for the book on peace pedagogies, a huge gap in literature, a huge gap in teacher training and preparation is really uh, the preparation of teachers to teach controversial issues and sensitive topics. So our teachers, at least in the context of Bosnia, really emphasize the importance and the urgency of being trained and supported in terms of how to tackle important and sensitive issues that usually require effective or trauma-informed facilitation skills, uh, which is also at the heart of their concern and at the heart of, of their sort of hesitation to bring in a lot of these issues and a lot of these discussions in the classroom. So teachers need to be adequately supported and adequately trained in connection uh, to, to this particular aspect. And here is just one example, again, not going into too many details. This is the invitation also for the audience to check on our Peace Education Hub, which Patricia also mentioned in the beginning, which is now developing this collaborative opportunities for students to apply for the internship, uh, to learn more and to contribute more at a global level in terms of research, in terms of practice, in terms of teaching and in terms of learning uh, in the ways that could, you can see here the broader strategic goal uh, goals of our Peace Education Hub. So the contribution of the student work and the internship and international and local collaborative initiatives could really contribute to something that is at the heart of this mission. And that is the promotion of the culture of peace and nonviolence in the context of education and values development. And here you see how that this is done through regional connection, through internationalization, through integrating the culture of peace in teacher education curricula, or through developing uh, peace education in different fields of formal and non-formal uh, spheres, and also in many other areas that you can uh, see in this map. So this is one example of how the University of Sarajevo and our specific center for peace education has tried for many years to carve out this space and visibility within the higher education institution to plant the seed of uh, peace education and to formally acknowledge the importance of institutionalizing peace pedagogy and peace education in higher education institutions. And lastly, in conclusion, uh, for this piece of in, uh, institutionalization and integration of peace pedagogies, we want to remind uh, university communities, which we also belong to, that there is not only the mission of the university to teach rigorous knowledge, disciplinary knowledge, content knowledge, for which we are actually you know, applying for when we study as students, but also which we are teaching when we are speaking from the positionality of professors, or that it is not only the mission of the university to do research, to do rigorous research, to disseminate information, to inform the decision uh, makers, the policy makers, which is also equally important and is also one of the central pillars of university institutions, 
but that there is also the third mission of universities, and that is closely related to the importance of recognizing and acknowledging that the universities need to prepare students to address issues of society and to contribute with their moral responsibility to their local, but also to their international communities. And in order to apply this third mission, it is really important to reiterate how uh, essential it is to understand the complexities of conflict and the messiness of our human responses to conflict, which we are seeing on a daily basis. We have seen that throughout the history. We have seen that through lived experiences. Uh, those of, uh, of us who lived through the conflicts, who lived, anyone who lived through the injustices, uh, oppressions, uh, so that we remind ourselves that on one hand, we do have the idea of rigorous professional knowledge, which is usually the instrumental rationality to address particular problem in the community by using the instrumental rationality to propose solutions. But this is usually not enough because the awareness of the swampy gray zones, indeterminate uh, practices, they usually go beyond the capacities of technically derived solutions. So we need other skills and we need other developments and reflections in order to propose solutions that would respond to, the, to, to this complexity of conflict. There's also the importance of recognizing the responsibility to teach people to imagine better futures, to imagine better ways so that we can shape our shared future together and therefore become more human in the process. This is also the responsibility of the universities. And we know that universities are facing huge problem and huge challenge with this particular aspect, especially these days when uh, a lot of humanities have been marginalized or excluded from the mainstream approaches in education and curriculum. And of course, that uh, pedagogy of responsibility, which reminds us that education is never politically neutral. It could be used as a weapon uh, in conflict, or it could be used as a generator for peace. So it's really important to educate people for their professional uh, expertise, but also for the critical citizenship at the same time, so simultaneously, so that the political, what is outside becomes pedagogical and the other way around, that we see that a lot of the issues that we are experiencing at the individual or at the family level sometimes are the mirrors of the larger social and political issues and, and spheres in, in the communities. And this, uh, with this, I would like to conclude with several of these uh, takeaways for the part that, sp that speaks to the institutionalization and integration of peace pedagogies as a reminder in the days and times in which we live today and the challenges we face. Uh, for the university context and for the university levels, it's really important that instead of avoiding uncomfortable truths or uncomfortable conversations, we need to work with them in, a, in an appropriate pedagogical way. So pedagogically with sensitivity and with open-mindedness, with open hearts and open souls, uh, with rigorous, but also with lots of empathy and uh, pedagogical sensitivity. We need to create spaces for holding these difficult conversations. So this is also very important takeaway from uh, the uh, discussions we, we shared with you. Uh, we would also like to emphasize that it's important to embrace the emotional aspects of human experience as much as this becomes challenging, especially with the rigorous approaches that sort of emphasize this rational, instrumental approaches to finding solutions to complex human uh, messiness uh, and, and problems and, and challenges, but the emotional and affective domains of learning are equally important. We need to engage with counter narratives in civil societies to sort of bridge the polarizations, the divisiveness, the fragmentation. This is also important. And of course, what we are trying to achieve today, we need to champion long-term peace promotion strategies in research, teaching, policy, and practice. And with this, I'd like to conclude our lecture and kindly ask Sarah just to make a final connection to the global sort of uh, community, which would invite for further comments and feedback from the audience and other questions and comments. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much. We won't spend uh, more time introducing. I think that the group would probably like to ask some questions and to discuss. Um, it goes without saying that uh, <laughs> there are dozens and dozens of active armed conflicts around the world at the moment. Um, and there are new types of conflicts and new types of wars, media wars, ideological discourse wars, environmental conflicts, new technologies, 
Um, and there are so many different approaches to peace building with and without connection to education. Um, I've mentioned a few here, Canada, USA, Rwanda, Israel, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia, but I mean, there are so many other instances where we could look at how peace pedagogies can connect there. Um, so we, we wanted to pose a few questions and you probably have some questions as well. Um, uh, for us, we, we thought it might be interesting to discuss how each of you, or each of us can connect peace pedagogies to other conflict and peace building contexts, including your own. Um, and what building peace uh, means for you and how you connect to it personally and professionally, and more specifically, what role you think um, we can play as teachers, students, as practitioners in different contexts to um, bring that right combination, bring that effective combination of peace pedagogies into play so that um, quality peace building work can take place. Thank you so much.